If you like this video, consider jumping over to Patreon and hitting the circle button to support the channel. Don't forget, the link is in the description, Sly. Yeah, Bentley, I remember where the link is. Not many other places it can be. Sly Cooper was a Sony-owned platformer series that debuted with its first game, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, in 2002 for the PlayStation 2. This game was also known as Kaito Sly Cooper in Japan and Sly Raccoon in Europe. That game, after becoming a hit, would be followed up with two more games created by the same studio. That studio being Sucker Punch Games, who would later go on to develop games such as the Infamous series and then Ghost of Tsushima after finishing up the Sly trilogy on PS2. This series was a big part of my childhood. The Sly Trilogy and the Kingdom Hearts games were my go-to games to play back in the days of the PS2. I'm still a big fan of both franchises to this day, but while I've replayed all the Kingdom Hearts games many times consistently as I've gotten older with no breaks, I haven't really touched any of the Sly games since I was in high school. Recently, the old Sly Cooper itch returned to me, and I couldn't shake it, so once again, I returned to my PS2 and pulled out the same copies of these three games that I've had since childhood to scratch the thievious itch. For those of you who don't know, Sly Cooper was one of the three big platformer franchises that Sony owned during the sixth generation, alongside Naughty Dog's Jack series and the Somniac's Ratchet and Clank franchise. Jack started out as a Banjo-styled collectathon platformer before shifting direction towards a more Grand Theft Auto-inspired series from Jack 2 onward. Meanwhile, Ratchet has kind of always had a focus on creative and destructive sci-fi weaponry, though I'd argue the first game was nowhere near as combat-focused as later games and did put some effort into exploration, which we would see return in other games such as A Crack in Time. In a similar vein, Sly Cooper is a platformer series with a focus more on stealth and narrative, but the first game is much more linear as opposed to its two sequels that go for a more open-world, hub-world approach. But I feel like before I go any further, there are a few things that I should get out of the way. First, in this retrospective for Sly, I'm only going to be talking about the original trilogy that was developed by Sucker Punch. Because in my eyes, those are the only Sly games worth my time. And after this moment, I will not be mentioning Thieves in Time, the 2013 Sanzaru game that would eventually come out on PS3. And no, it will never receive a video all its own. This is for a few reasons. The biggest reason being, I just flat out don't like Thieves in Time. I straight up hate it, in fact. And I personally have no desire to bust out into big rants on why I think it sucks or how I think it's a disgrace to this franchise. And I also have no interest in making constant jabs about it as I talk about the main three games in any of my videos on them. Like I said, it's not worth my time ranting about it at this point since every Sly fan has heard every single complaint anyone could ever have with that game. Another reason I won't acknowledge it is that since that game was handled by Senzaru with no proper involvement from Sucker Punch, and it's so different in terms of tone, art style, writing, and just everything in general when compared to the original trilogy, that it ends up feeling disconnected and disattached from that original series. The best way I've ever heard it explained is that the original trilogy are the graphic novels, while Thieves in Time is a Saturday morning cartoon adaptation loosely based on those same comics. It's just so far removed from everything Sucker Punch's Sly Cooper was that it doesn't feel like an entry in the series to me. And also, this is all ignoring the fact that I don't own a PS3 anymore. Mistress told me that Calvin has a PS3, and apparently she's borrowed it a handful of times. I have no desire to borrow a console from someone else in a dimension I'm still learning things about, while also having to go out and buy a new copy of a game I fucking hate. So for all of those reasons, I won't be talking about Thieves in Time when I review the Sly games, and after this point, I will not mention it again, essentially acting like it doesn't exist. Trust me, it's better for all of us if I only talk about the trilogy and ignore Sanzaru's entry. The fans of Thieves in Time, who do exist, much to my surprise admittedly, they can still enjoy their game if I choose to ignore it, and I can live in a better time by ignoring a game that I fucking hate. Besides, the only good thing to come out of Thieves in Time is Tennessee Kid Cooper because he is a joy. Alright, so let's get back on track. Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus is the first game in Sucker Punch's trilogy. Now, getting this out of the way, I like this game as much as I like the other two games in the series, but I think it's my least favorite out of the three. Not to say that it's bad, it's just a process elimination kind of deal. Starting out, let's talk about the plot, which is about our title character, Sly Cooper, having his parents murdered when he was a child by a gang of five fiendish criminals called, well, the Fiendish Five, who after putting an end to his parents make off with the Thievius Raccoonus, a book containing all the techniques and secret arts of the Cooper family from every single generation. 
After this, he's dumped at the Happy Camper Orphanage where he'll meet his lifelong friends and eventual found family, Bentley and Murray. When they all become adults, they leave the orphanage as a gang and begin pulling off heist until eventually leading us all the way to the start of this game, with Sly breaking into police HQ to make off with a file that contains information on where each of the five members of the Fiendish Five currently reside. That's where we, the player, come in as we have to assist Sly in the five different worlds as he fights, stealths, and steals through various levels to get back the pages of his family's legacy. It's a simple setup. Our hero wants to avenge his fallen parents and reclaim what was stolen from his family. It's a solid setup too. It gives plenty of reason for why Sly would do all of this and go through all this crap. And honestly, the story gets better upon learning about Clockwork, the leader of the five, but we'll get to him in a bit. I feel like Sly's origin story alone, it kind of illustrates something about the game that I'll be touching upon multiple times throughout the video, and that's the fact that the game is heavily influenced by comic books. Sly's backstory is very Batman inspired. Now, with each level comes a new member of the Fiendish Five, and each with their own unique personalities and lairs that you'll have to explore before reaching and defeating them. I adore the levels in this game, each standing out from one another and perfectly fitting their respective boss. Whether it's Mesa City's gambling-filled crime city atmosphere with loads of neon lights and casinos, or the spooky swamps of Haiti with its foreboding tone and dark colors extending the murky waters and greenery. To be honest, I think atmosphere is something this game does exceptionally well. Each level with its design, colors, and especially with its music just get you in the perfect mood and immerses you in the worlds. The game's style in general is just fantastic, going with high contrast colors alongside a cell shaded graphical style that means these games hit the mark of feeling like moody graphic novels and are still appealing to look at to this day. Although, since we're on the subject of the levels, I'd like to point out that while every level feels and looks different, they all have very similar structure, save for the last one. That structure is always a starting mission of Sly getting into the main hub, then having to collect three keys to unlock the first lock, before then needing all seven keys in any given level for the last lock that will allow you to face the boss of that world. There are no optional missions in Sly 1, this is not a Mario 64 type affair. You will have to collect every key in every level in order to progress the way the developers intended, which wouldn't be an issue, but since it's a 3D platformer, there are levels that are nowhere near as fun as others. And since it's a 3D platformer from the 2000s, those less fun levels are usually mini game levels that are nothing like the main gameplay at all. The three lock thing on the first half of levels make it seem like you can pick and choose what missions to do, but you can't. That seven lock gate leading to the bosses will always remind you they have to go do every mission. In the first level, Raleigh's, it's fine since only one of the seven missions is a mini game. But as the game goes on, more and more missions become mini games, all culminating in the final level, where it's essentially a mini game gauntlet with a turret section, car driving, hacking, and an FPS escort mission, with only really two platforming levels, as well as a small platforming section in the final phase of Clockwork's fight, with his other two phases being on a jetpack. So yeah, non-platforming parts of this platform game are about as common as the platforming bits. To be fair, I don't think this makes the game bad, but it makes this game a very big culprit of the oh crap, I don't want to do this part thing that many games from this generation seem to have. Whether it's the racing levels with a van that suffer from an exceptionally small margin of error alongside awkward physics, or the piranha-like mission in Miss Ruby's level that has a two minute time limit for no reason that I can discern, where you pilot a floating moped or RE4 jet ski type vehicle that admittedly feels better to drive than the van, but that's besides the point. And with that all said, the main gameplay loop is great, the platforming is solid, and I like how, as the game progresses, the platforming levels become more and more challenging as you gain more and more abilities and skills. Along with that, the mixed in stealth adds for some nice sneaking elements to gameplay, only enhanced by how you can only take a maximum of 3 hits, which encourages you to actually stealth and not just bolt through every enemy. And you can only take a maximum of 3 hits if you have 2 lucky charms, because without those you can only take 1 hit, like this is Katana Zero or Hotline Miami, which gives you even more reason to act fast and avoid conflict if possible. Those extra hits are gained in one of two ways. First is by picking up a horseshoe that's on the map, and the second, much more common way, is to collect 100 coins, which instantly become lucky charms for Sly. If you already have a silver one, you'll gain a gold one and then gain the max 3 hit limit. And an extra bonus, if you gain 100 coins with two lucky charms already on you, is an extra life. You shouldn't run out of lives, given it isn't super hard to farm them given this method. And I generally don't know what happens if you run out of lives, because I never have. 
Now on the topic of level stuff, I like how it's possible to complete a given world in one go. You don't need later abilities to do everything in Raleigh's place, and you can clear everything there before ever setting foot on Mugshot's turf, which means you can 100% this game progressively so that by the time you defeat Clockwork, you've done it. This isn't to say I mind the more Metroidvania approach of returning to previous levels with new abilities, but for a more linear 3D platformer game like this, I prefer the approach they went with as it makes the game a more comfy experience for me. Speaking of things I like, I really like the characters in this game. Much like the levels, each character stands out with colorful personalities and striking designs that just grab your attention. I think the Fiendish Five are all great in terms of design, each absolutely selling their respective gimmicks and are complemented excellently by their previously discussed respective levels. Now, I don't think they're perfect, but they work really well, in my opinion, as villains for Sly and thus the player to face up against. Also, there's a really nice progression of how big a threat they are, starting with Raleigh, a frog who simply became a pirate out of boredom, and slowly progressing with each member, getting more threatening essentially, until we peak with Clockwork, who is a robot owl who has lived for centuries on end, fueled solely by his hatred for a specific family. While I'm talking about villains, isn't it funny how Mugshot and Panda King would return in Sly 3, and Clockwork would be a major factor in Sly 2's plot, without even actually being alive during that game, but then Raleigh and Miss Ruby never appear again after this game? I mean, perhaps it was for the best. Who knows? It just has me wondering what happened to those two is all. I will say it is kind of funny in hindsight that Sly would eventually bring Panda King into his gang. It makes sense in context of Sly 3's plot, but it's kind of funny because in Sly 1, the first thing we actually see Panda King do on screen in gameplay is essentially murder an entire village by causing an avalanche because he can. Now, the stars of our game's cast are the Cooper Gang and Carmelia Montoya Fox, and they are fantastic. Sly himself is, in my opinion, a very compelling protagonist, especially in terms of platformer protagonist. His motivation to redeem his family name, and reclaim the Thievius Raccoonus that embodies his family's legacy, all grip me into this game and its story. Given the context we have, this is bound to be something Sly has imagined time and time again as he grew up, picturing the day he'd regain the pages and put an end to the Fiendish Five once and for all. I like how Sly is a cocky guy. The dude's out here cracking quips when faced against opposition. But, in moments like him facing head to head against Clockwork, the man whose immortality is powered by his hatred for Sly's entire family, the man who murdered his parents, the man who took everything away from him. In instances like that, Sly drops the cocky act and gets serious. He's more than just a cocky bastard who makes quips. He's a three-dimensional raccoon, and I feel like that's part of what makes him stand out amongst his peers in this genre. Sucker Punch, in general, are really good at making protagonists. And this was something I appreciated about the big three of Sony's lineup back then. Ratchet, and even Jack past the first game, had a bit more going on as characters than what was on the surface. And I feel like that's what helped all of them stay remembered long after their status as the big three PlayStation boys disappeared. Of course, now only one of the three is even still around, meanwhile the other two float around in Sony limbo, where they occasionally get used for merchandise, and that's about it. Although personally, I believe it's for the best if Sly remains dormant, as I can't see anyone other than Sucker Punch doing a Sly game and doing it well. On that subject, I wouldn't want SP to feel obligated to make more Sly Cooper, especially since they're one of the few studios that I can think of who knows when to end a series and move on to something else. Now, it should come as no surprise given the subject of the video that Sly happens to be my favorite of the trio given how fondly I talk about this trilogy. I think out of the three, Sly definitely had the best narratives, at least in my opinion, which I feel helps him stand out amongst other platformers of the time where story was usually not as important. To me, a Sly Cooper game is more than just the gameplay. It's the characters and the story, because that's the standard Sucker Punch set with their games. In my opinion, a Sly Cooper game with a bad story would not be a Sly Cooper game. And at that point, you just wouldn't be playing Sly Cooper. You'd be playing a mediocre platformer with a raccoon. Now, I firmly stand by my stance that Carmelita, Bentley, and Murray are fantastic. But unfortunately, in this game particularly, they aren't anywhere near as layered as Sly is. They aren't completely flat, for the most part, Murray is the weakest of the three members of the Cooper gang in my opinion. He isn't given a whole lot of time to actually develop in this game, but he does have this mini arc about overcoming his insecurities and becoming less of a burden. It's not super in-depth and sort of just happens. Of course, with the gift of hindsight, I can forgive this a little, since it would be followed up and continued in the next two games. By the end of the trilogy, the Murray would truly grow into his own, and his story here was only setting up that arc. So in that context, he isn't that bad. But if you look at him in this game on his own, I can understand why someone would look at Murray and take away that he was a flat nothing character. Binley's in a sort of similar but better boat. He acts as the Otacon to Sly Solid Snake for the entire game, as well as just generally being the go-to guy for the game to use to explain mechanics and controls to the player. 
He's not forgotten by the game and even has a big shining moment in the final level when he saves Carmelita and Sly from being gassed by clockwork, but for most of the game he sticks to the background like Murray, but is more of a vocal presence in comparison. Sorry Sly, but this is one mission you will have to accomplish without me. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? Sure I do. My scanners have picked up verifiable paranormal activity. But that's not the problem. This swamp is oozing with disgusting mold and bacteria. Suck it up, Bentley. We got work to do. All right, then. Also, like Murray, I can assure you that in the next two games, Bentley becomes a much stronger character writing-wise and presence-wise. Now, Carmelita? She's a big one. If you know about Sly Cooper at all, you're definitely familiar with her. And if you're familiar with sites like Fur Affinity or DeviantArt, then you're undoubtedly familiar with Carmelita Montoya Fox. And for good reason. Boobs! In this game, she acts as a foil to Sly. She's the Zenigata to his Lupin, and acts as the cop to his robber. I like how the rivalry in this game is presented as Sly having fun with her, creating a flirty back and forth that initially starts pretty one-sided, as she's more focused on putting the raccoon behind bars. But it slowly starts going both ways with Carmelita slowly realizing how good a guy Sly actually is, despite his profession. She even gives Sly a 10 second head start at the end of the game, an agreement they made during their temporary truce during the climax. Unfortunately, like Sly's friends, she doesn't get a whole lot of time to shine, relatively speaking, when compared to the title character himself. This goes for basically every side character in the game, honestly. The game's main focus is on Sly, which makes sense. This is his story. His name is in the title, but the point remains. I like how Carmelita's first scene in the game reveals to us fairly naturally that they've been at this for years, and that's before Sly gives the player his backstory even. Huh, and I was gonna give it to you as a little token of my... Hey, you know, that bazooka really brings out the color of your eyes. Very fetching. You think? This pistol packs a paralyzing punch. You ought to try it. Might snap you out of your crime spree. And give up our little rendezvous? Plenty of time for that once you're safely behind bars. If you have no context about any of the Sly games going into the first game, this opening is really good. First, you see Sly shrouded in shadows, only getting brief peeks of him as he parkours across the rooftops. Then, you get that beautiful title screen where it's just panning around Sly as he stands on Police HQ. Then, when you press New Game, you get this immediate phone call on the Binocucom that immediately introduces Sly, Bentley, and Murray's initial dynamics before you even learn their backstories. Sly's the cool, confident field man. Bentley the neurotic, nervous Otacon, and Murray's the getaway driver. You get that general initial startup of their dynamic as a gang, and a little bit of their dynamic as friends too. Then, Sly goes across the rooftops, gets inside. The getting inside is easy, the game even teaches you one of the most important tricks in the entire franchise, which is pressing the circle button. You will be pressing the circle button a lot. Then once inside, you get this pretty cinematic moment where you have to jump down. Then you prowl the halls of Police HQ until you find an open window, go out the window, skirt across the side of the rooftop to get into Carmelita's office, and then you get Sly's file. Then you go outside to the fire escape, and that's when Carmelita's first scene shows up, and you get the scene I just mentioned, where it naturally introduces to you, the player, Sly and Carmelita's dynamic. Then you have to run away through the parking lot as she fires electric blast at you. Then when you get into the van, which has parked outside, and you jump inside it, she basically yells that she'll catch you, and then you transition into Sly's narration where he gives you the backstory. I like that the backstory isn't what the game first throws on you. What the game first throws on you is something more engaging. And then once you've been hooked in with the little breadcrumbs they give you at the start, then they give you the setup. It's pretty cool. The title of this game overall, though, is very fitting. While everything else in this game does matter one way or another, the game's major focus is on Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. And like I said, later games would improve on this certain aspect of the cast and make all of them more present and more important, giving them more focus, and even making other people besides Sly playable. I think that this game is fine for what it's doing. It's the first game in the series. It's setting the groundwork. What it is, is being the first game and not just a trilogy, but the start of an entire new series. Growing pains were bound to happen. Thievius Raccoonus was written by Nate Fox, who would go on to write the following two Sly games, Ban of Thieves and Honor Among Thieves, as well as going on to direct the infamous games and Ghost of Tsushima, though that game had a second director as well. I think part of the reason the Sly trilogy have such good, tight, and consistent writing can be attributed to them having one consistent writer across the trilogy. When you have a creative vision and a desire to present that vision, it always comes across when sprawled out onto the page for an audience to take in. And I think that's another reason the story of the Sly Cooper games stuck out in people's minds and continue to even today. 
Asef Hakik, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, composed the soundtrack for this game. You might recognize Asif as they composed the music for a game called Godai Elemental Force and also composed the music for Tomba 2. That one's for you, Alex. Asif's score is great, though I admittedly prefer the more moody, atmospheric tones that Pete McConnell's music in Sly 2 and 3 would present. Although not to say Asif's tracks lack atmosphere entirely, far from it, as each track in the game excellently puts the player in the headspace of a given level setting and situation. It really truly does make you feel like Sly Cooper, though some tracks do go too far over the line and become a bit too cartoony for my tastes, though that only ever happens with the more energetic tracks like boss music or encounters. And they still slap. What's also interesting to note is that Asef's tracks don't feel out of place when compared to McConnell's tracks in the later two games. All three of these soundtracks feel like they belong to the same franchise. And that's a good thing, that consistency's nice, but you don't lack the individual flavor that these two composers have. Now in terms of the art in general, I've mentioned the art direction a couple times, Sly Cooper in the Thievius Raccoonus has a lot of artists. Too many artists to name here, so I'm gonna have Wally throw a list on screen from the Sly Wiki. Early concept art shows that from the start, you could tell that the team at Sucker Punch had a clear vision for this game, really leaning into the comic book inspiration with a moody atmosphere. Though unfortunately, I can't find much of the concept art, but this idea and intent bleeds into the final game clear as day. I mentioned how good the levels are at capturing the art direction and atmosphere earlier, but I forgot to mention the motion comic cutscenes, which I feel add the cherry on top of the Sunday that is this game's presentation. I feel like if these cutscenes had been fully animated, I'm not sure the comic book vibe would have been as clearly sold as it is with the motion comic style. I'm so glad they stuck to their guns and chose a cutscene style that fit their game more stylistically. And I honestly can't imagine a Sly Cooper game with animated cutscenes. Overall, I more than think that the good of this game outweighs any of its flaws. It's like the original Devil May Cry in that way. Sure, the flaws are still there, but flaws don't make a game as a whole bad, especially since every game has them. What matters is the overall package, and I just think that the first Sly game is not only a good start to the trilogy, but just an overall good game in its own right. Yes, it can be fairly simple in places, frustrating in a few, and lacking in others, but overall, it's a strong game with fun platforming, excellent atmosphere, and lovable characters that I'd gladly recommend to anyone in a heartbeat. It's not a super long game, by the way, which is why this video isn't all that long. You can beat the game relatively quickly, and that's with getting all the bottles along the way. Only thing that might take a bit of time are the time trials that each platforming level has because they are very unforgiving and require basically perfect performance in any given level you do them in, which I imagine the speedrunners in my audience love the sound of. To end this video, I want to rank all the bosses of the game just because I wanna. <laughs> what are you kidding? Mugshot is probably my favorite boss in terms of the actual fight. You can't hurt him directly and have to instead hit mirrors to beam light into crystals, like God beams the answer into my head. This will destroy his guns after all the mirrors are turned. You do this exact thing three times, each time it gets harder and harder to do. I had the most trouble during the second phase. I really like how the third phase uses the spire jump you got from Raleigh's page in the previous level. Insolent child, you shall pay dearly for your disrespect. The Panda King is my second favorite, which is admittedly due to my bias for the character, which you'll understand when I cover Sly 3. Although it is still interesting that he has a body count. The fight's super easy though, honestly, with super easy to read attacks and nothing really changing to make it harder throughout the fight. But I really like how it plays out narratively and that does big things for this boss. Sly outright says to Panda King that while he was originally here to just regain the page of the book, he's now here to also put an end to the Panda King's merciless homicide, which he's been doing via using his fireworks to cause avalanches. It's a good moment that shows exactly what makes Sly and his crew different from Clockwork and his pals. They may be on the same sides of the law, but they are not the same side in general, and this comes down to morals. Perfection has no age. What? You're immortal? Revenge is the prime ingredient in the fountain of youth. I've kept myself alive for hundreds of years with a steady diet of jealousy and hate, awaiting a day when I will finally eclipse your family's thieving reputation. Now, speaking of bosses with really, really good narratives, I really wish I liked Clockwork's fight more. Honestly. Thematically, he's without a doubt my favorite, as it's finally Sly coming face to face with the man behind the slaughter of his family, and the final confrontation that not only proves Clockwork wrong in his assumption that the Cooper line would be nothing without their book, but also allows Sly to finally achieve what he's wanted since that fateful day happened. I love how dark this plot reveal is, by the way. Clockwork basically revealing to both Sly and the player that he intentionally left Sly alive to prove that the Cooper family would be nothing without that book. 
He knew Connor and his wife had a son, and he wanted that child to suffer just to prove a fucking point. Now, unfortunately, while I love the story stuff here, the fight itself is not very fun. At least I don't think so. Two thirds of it are on a jetpack you've never used before this moment, with the third face being the only part where you're on foot doing the platforming. And that's a super brief bit before you're just whacking away at him. Though the platforming gauntlet before you get to his face is fantastic and puts all of your skills to the test and I love it. Oh, and also fun fact, because of how quickly you'll end up smacking him to death, his final line to Sly is cut off by the game, which sucks because it's a good line. Come back. You will never be with me. Clockwork is superior. How delightful. We have a guest. The only thing is... I hate unexpected guests! Raleigh's alright. He's a fine first boss that has multiple phases that slightly change what you're doing, but like Panda King, he doesn't really take advantage of any of Sly's special skills. But unlike Panda King, this is because he's the first boss. He's very easy and okay. He's nothing too special, but he's not bad. He's only really this low because he's kind of boring, and there isn't a whole lot of narrative stuff to bolster that up. I see your mouth moving, but I Miss Ruby's fight is the worst in the game for me. Now, I'm playing it on PS2, which at least means it works, since, fun fact, on PS3, due to the remix music, the button prompts don't sync with the music like they're supposed to, thus making the fight even harder. But even on PS2, this fight still kinda sucks. I just don't like it. I mean, I, I can't really say it's bad per se, it just doesn't really work for me, and I don't really like it. All right, I think I've gotten all my basic thoughts on Sly 1 out. Overall, I'd highly recommend playing this game, same with the next two as well. This whole trilogy is great if you ask me, and my whole motivation for doing this video as well as its sequels was almost entirely as an excuse for me to just to talk about Sly Cooper since I really like this trilogy and I've really liked it since childhood. The next time I return to a Sly Cooper topic, I'll be reviewing what I consider the best game in the trilogy, Sly 2 Band of Thieves. I look forward to diving into that game and why I consider it the best title in this iconic trilogy. Trust me, Sly 2 is so hot, it's cool. Huh, can't believe I went this whole time without being interrupted. I wonder what's going on. Wait, no, there it is. What are you doing in my room? That is an excellent question, but I don't think it's important right now. I think it is. Well, you do have a point, but I don't have an answer, so we're kind of at an impasse here. Yo, Dove, what's good? Hey, hey Calvin. Calvin. <sighs> I will never get used to that. What is it, Calvin? So, there's a human in Dad's room. What? Well, see, the thing is... Sure, just go see for yourselves. <sighs> Why bother listening to me? Ma'am, there you are. What's going on, Babs? So, a human followed Emily home. They do that a lot. Wait, they do? Gee, I can't imagine why. Anyway... Once the guy saw me, he screamed and ran into the nearest room. Is... is he gonna be okay? As I'm the law poisoned. Calvin's dad is Cthulhu, darling, remember? Whoever that guy was is not coming back out. Right. <sighs> I'll get him up and bucket. Babs, I'm gonna need your help. Poor guy. Oh well. Look on the bright side. At least you get a meal out of it. I know, but it's still quite unfortunate. Quite. But that's what happens when you wander around other people's homes. What the fuck just happened? Hi, human bestie. Have you seen like a super cute hunk around here? Human guy, kind of scrawny. Really dope jacket though. Yeah, basement. Aww. And he was cute too. <sighs> I bet he was, Emily. He was. 